Please welcome the Chief Executive Officer at Lunar Outpost, Justin Cyrus. Hi, my name is Justin Cyrus and I'm the CEO of Lunar Outpost. And this, coming on stage, is our mobile autonomous prospecting platform, MAP, that's headed to the moon within a year. Now, on video behind me, you'll see a few of our first missions that are gonna start this year and go into 2025. But before we dive into the missions or how robots are unlocking space, let's talk a little bit more about why Lunar Outpost was founded. So I was fortunate enough to grow up next to NASA Johnson Space Center with some of the top scientists and engineers on the planet. And unfortunately, some of them got frustrated by the lack of progress we were making towards making space sustainable and pushing beyond Earth's boundaries. Uh, so that told me very early on, we need to find a reason to go into space and commercialize if we truly are going to successfully push beyond the bounds of Earth. And on screen behind me, you'll see our HIPPO, our 1,000 kilogram class robotic system that's purpose built to do just that. And one of the first commercial applications of robots in space will be resources. There are two things that space has an infinite amount of. The first is power, and the second is resources. And if we can find a way to access either one of those two things, we can fundamentally change the way that we operate as humanity. And on screen behind me, you'll see Hippo utilizing its rocket mining technology to extract materials from meters below the lunar surface, process them, and then deliver them out of that permanently shadowed region. Now, there are many other commercial use cases as well. And one of the most exciting that I'm really looking forward to being a part of is tourism. Uh, commercial tourism, having folks go and stay on the moon just like a vacation if you come to Las Vegas or you head out to LA. And with that commercial tourism, they will be able to utilize the infrastructure that NASA is putting in place and these outposts uh, that are being built and maintained by robotic systems just like MAP. So one of the benefits that we have now that we've never really had before is strong support not only uh, you know, from the investment community, awesome investors are getting into this space, but also from government agencies, such as NASA, ESA, Luxembourg Space Agency, and others. And that strong public-private partnerships start enabling new business cases that weren't possible in the past. And so here in a second, you'll see the NASA administrator handing me the first check in human history for space resources. And what this does is set a legal and procedural framework for our company and companies like ours for generations to come to go out and commercialize space. So what we do at Lunar Outpost is create fully autonomous robots and software for conquering extreme environments. And of course, true to our namesake, one of those environments is the lunar surface. And all of this is building towards our vision to end scarcity here on Earth, to address all the material shortages that we have and truly enable a, a more fair and equitable economy and ecosystem. So accessing those infinite resources of space. Now here's where we're at today. We have already deployed thousands of products here on Earth and collected over 35 billion data points at well over 99% uptime. And this not only shows that we can commercialize a product and scale it, but it's allowed us to put a cloud architecture in place through AWS that we can now leverage uh, for our data processing on the moon. We're currently operating on Mars as part of the MOXIE program that's led by Dr. Forrest Mayan, who's sitting in this crowd today. And that's a project led by MIT and NASA that's taking CO2 out of the Martian atmosphere and turning it into oxygen through a, a reverse fuel cell process running at about 800 degrees Celsius. And then of course, we have multiple contracted missions to the lunar surface. The first of which is fully commercial and will be the first rover at the lunar south pole in human history. So this location is not only exciting because of the resource implications that we talked about earlier, 
but it's also pretty exciting because that's where astronauts are headed in 2025. So think of this a bit as a scouting mission. But as you heard in Ariel's talk, uh, you know, a few minutes ago, this is a commercial mission. We actually only have literally one dollar from NASA on this entire mission. The rest of our customers are strong commercial industry partners and research institutes that are leading the way uh, towards making space more sustainable. And a few of those payloads are from MIT. And of course, we have Nokia's LTE, high bandwidth communication technology, that will be deploying on the lunar surface. Now, here's where we're at today. Uh, I love showing pictures to show you guys it's real. This truly is going to be flying within 12 months. We have done vibration and shock testing to make sure we can survive the launch and landing environments, which can be quite harsh. We have done TVAC testing and testing at the Lunar Testbed Facility to ensure our robots can operate not only for a few days, but years at a time on the lunar surface, which starts enabling those new use cases. And as we develop this technology, we're also lining up future missions. So our second mission is a fully funded NASA mission that's headed to Reiner Gamma, a magnetic anomaly on the lunar surface that has puzzled scientists for hundreds of years. And Lunar Outpost, along with Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory, our job is to go figure out why is that anomaly there so we can learn more about the formation of the moon and our solar system. Now, that's really just the beginning. Those are our two first missions, but there are dozens of landers headed to the moon this decade. Starting with Intuitive Machines IM-1 mission this December. And what this allows for the first time is continuous, reliable access to the surface of the moon. And with that reliable access, you can start building business cases off of that infrastructure. And by the time we get to 2025, we will have heavy lift uh, launch and landing capabilities where we can land and return tons of cargo and humans to and from the lunar surface. So this is truly a revolutionary moment in the space economy. So what is Lunar Outpost doing about it? This is our game plan. This is what our robotics are purpose built for. We're starting off with planetary mobility, spacecraft as a service, if you will. So taking government and commercial payloads to the lunar surface. So similar to how Launch provides people access to different points in space, Lunar Outpost provides folks access to different points on planetary bodies. It's as simple as that. We're building out towards the infrastructure in cislunar space. So a lot of folks uh, utilizing robotic systems are going to be creating this infrastructure for the first time and maintaining it as well. And then we are working towards utilizing that infrastructure for our long-term goal of the utilization of space resources. So let's dive in a little bit more. Planetary mobility. So this is the Mobile Autonomous Prospecting Platform. This is very close to what we're actually gonna be sending up next year. It's only about a 10 kilogram class platform, size of a small dog, if it's hard to tell from the audience how big it is. But compare that to the current state of the art. You might be wondering, why are we going for smaller rovers? What is our goal? What are we trying to accomplish? Currently, Mars Perseverance rover, awesome, amazing feat of technological uh, and science engineering. However, it costs $3 billion. If we're truly gonna make space sustainable, we need to bring that cost down by orders of magnitude. And then look at NASA's Viper rover. Going to the moon uh, next year or in a couple years, and it costs around $500 million. It's gonna last for about 100 Earth days. But these are purpose-built science and exploration robotic systems. Lunar Outpost, has created a line of robotic systems that are commercial to drive that cost down and to truly make space sustainable, starting with MAP. And as we build our way up, you'll see a few of these robots throughout the presentation. We have HL MAP, a 300 kilogram class system, and working our way up to HIPPO, that 1,000 kilogram class robot. And of course, we cannot forget astronaut mobility. We'll find out. I'm kind of hoping I have a self-driving car here soon. I, I've been wanting one for a while, but I think astronauts might have it sooner than we have it here on Earth. 
Uh, so the next generation of lunar mobility is going to be led by Lunar Outpost and our partners, Northrop Grumman, Intuitive Machines, AVL, and Michelin, to provide these astronauts access to these different regions on the lunar surface. Now let's talk a little bit just why you can't take an Earth robot, yeet it up on a SpaceX Falcon 9, and have it work in space. It's a very harsh environment. You not only have high radiation that will fry most commercial uh, electronics, but you also have a very dynamic environment, going from negative 200 degrees Celsius to plus 200 degrees Celsius over the course of one lunar day-night cycle. And then you have other factors, including electrostatic regolith that stick to the solar panels and are hard to mitigate. That combined with limited supporting infrastructure, no GPS, uh, and other technologies, it makes it a very difficult prospect to operate on these planetary bodies. So Lunar Outpost is doing significant testing out at relevant environments. This is actually the Great Sand Dunes. I love this picture. If you've never been, awesome park in southern Colorado. Uh, very beautiful, pristine. Uh, NASA does some robotics competitions out there. And with the right permits, you can go test your robots out there as well. And what we test for is the operations, uh, you know, those 14-day operational time frames to really start ironing out all the bugs before we get on the lunar surface. So combine this with the thermal vacuum and the lunar testbed facility, we're confident that our robotics systems will be reliable on the lunar surface. And what that enables is robots unlocking space. Robots that are going to start building and maintaining large-scale infrastructure on the moon. And this is actually a picture from NASA from decades ago. And honestly, they got it pretty darn close of what these outposts are going to look like. You have everything from the habitats to life support systems to the power communications, launching landing pads, and roads. Uh, and Lunar Outpost has a contract with NASA, actually, to make launch and landing pads for heavy lift landers, which we're quite excited about. But robotic systems will create this infrastructure and maintain it over time so we can properly leverage our astronauts' skill sets on these other planetary bodies and make the most of their time there. Now, I do want to leave you with a little bit of food for thought. Space resources. I told you we can go out and extract them. I told you there's an infinite amount of space resources. But what resources are actually available on the moon specifically? One of the first that people are going to go access is water ice, hydrogen and oxygen. But it's extremely valuable in the cislunar economy, not only for astronauts, for consumption, for life support systems, but also for refueling in space and to utilize as a rocket fuel to get transports back off the moon. And there are other uh, more exciting resources as well that are extremely rare and scarce here on Earth. And one of my favorites is helium-3, a rare isotope that, when combined with fusion energy, becomes the most valuable material on Earth. It is currently trading for about $16,000 per gram. That's more than gold, silver, platinum group metals, or palladium. And this is plentiful on the lunar surface within the first few centimeters because it has been deposited by solar winds over billions of years. And that's just one resource. There are infinite types of resources that we can access, whether it's for manufacturing on the moon, manufacturing in cislunar space, high-value platinum group metals that we want to bring back here to Earth. That's really just the tip of the iceberg. So how are we going to get there? These are our first few steps as a company. We have our first mission going to the Lunar South Pole within a year. We have our second mission headed to Reiner Gamma, a magnetic anomaly that's been puzzling scientists for generations. And as a part of those first two missions, our goal is to prove that it's possible, to leverage the transportation and other infrastructure that's being put in place so we can start building towards our long-term vision of accessing the infinite resources of space. 
So thank you very much for taking the time to listen to this talk. We are growing quite quickly, and we would love to see a lot of your resumes. Um, we, <laughs> I'll just, uh, uh, no, no shame on that one. Honestly, please apply. Come visit us at the booth. There's a lot of folks out in the expo. Thank you.